Hey, it is a Tiki Technical Tuesday, and in this episode, we are sculpting a new mug. I am so excited. I've been wanting to do this mug for a long time, and it's something that I get asked about a lot. It is a continuation of a series that I have been working on since 2016, when I sculpted my very first Puka Pounder. Oh, God, I cannot believe I just messed that up. Let's just clip that. So when I sculpted my very first Poi Pounder mug. What's a Poi Pounder? I'm so glad you asked. A Poi Pounder is a tool. It's a stone tool, although they weren't always made of stone, that you will find in Hawaii and throughout all of Polynesia. It was used to mash taro root, like bump, bump, bump. You mash it like this and you make it into Poi, like a, a delicious food. Well, I'm not a big Poi fan myself, but a lot of people love it. Um, I love Poi Pounders because of their incredible shape. I love it because it's an incredibly efficient tool, and I love it because it's found throughout Polynesia. It is such a beautiful design, ergonomic, great in the hand, and it does a great job. So I thought it would be neat to make one into a mug that you could sip from, uh, and I plan on making one of these every single year. Now, this was the first I did back in 2016. It is, in fact, the last Vantiki mug that I did in Hawaii. We moved that year, and um, I didn't even get to finish this uh, uh, entire edition because we moved, the molds got jumbled around. Anyways, not too many of these things got made. Now, I did go back, as promised, and I made another run. This was in 2017. I was like, I'm going to do this every year, and we made this one. Um, I love it. They're great. And then I kind of didn't make a pounder mug for a while uh, until just a couple years back, I made the Puka Pounder, which I think is fantastic. This is unique shape found only on one island in Hawaii. It's called a stirrup style, and I think it is pretty awesome. Now, I think it's time for me to make another one. In fact, this is going to be the final one, and it's going to be an open edition with something else that I'm kind of excited about. I would make these pounder mugs by dipping them in underglaze to make that kind of false volcanic rock look. And since they have this rounded bottom, there would always be a part of the mug that touched the bottom of the kiln. And occasionally I would get little white bits or uneven areas of underglaze. And I wasn't really happy with that. So I thought, what if we could make the mug itself out of a dark clay body? And I did a bunch of tests. First up, I played this incredible, it's like a black ceramic slip. I got this from Seattle Pottery Company. Oh, it's just gorgeous, but problems. It does something called off-gassing during firing, and this just was no good. I could not get it to work. Um, and then I thought maybe porcelain would do the trick. After lots of online searching, I found this. What I think is a super beautiful kind of, just like, it's like a, I just love this shade of black. It's just gorgeous. It looks like basalt. It's gonna look fantastic. And this is what I wanna do the new edition of Pounder Mugs in. In fact, this is going to be an open edition. My plan is to sculpt this, mold it, and then just slowly cast a certain number of them every month, and I'm going to just number them. So the first one I cast will be number one, and then we'll number two and number three, and I'll just go on and on and on until people don't want one anymore. Uh, and we will change them throughout the the course of this open edition. Maybe some of them will have a different interior, gla the interior glaze color. Maybe some of them will have some other little detail stuck on them. I don't know. It's just something that will let me experiment with the shape, the form, and the color forever, which I'm pretty excited about. Anyway, let's start sculpting one. So with a quick trip to the hardware store, we grabbed a bunch of three quarter inch pipe, some fittings, and of course, a little bit of wood and our plan. I know what you're thinking. This looks like a lot of stuff for an armature. And you're right, because I don't want to make just one armature. I want to make two. Well, one armature that has two bases because I have learned when making these pounder mugs that they're a bit tricky. Uh, either I make a base that has it hanging and it gets a little tricky to set up the basic form, or I make a base where I have to sculpt the thing upside down and keep taking it up to look at it to make sure it's right side up. It's just, it's a curious shape and I'm going to have a rod coming out of here. So um, I'd like to be able to set up the form like this to make the general form like this and then have a second armature that I can put it in like this for sculpting it. At least, that's the goal. 
So right away, once I started putting things together, I realized I had a bit of an issue. All the screws in the studio were too long and would stick out of the bottom of the plywood. So that meant I had to go back to the hardware store and get some very short screws that would actually fit. So now that I got the right size screws, it's time to put this all together. Now I was pretty meticulous about putting the flange in the center of this board because it's critical for the jig that I'm going to use. You're going to see I actually take uh, some measuring tools and really get an accurate measurement of this flange because again, that's going to be important for the jig. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and then once I got all those uh, measurements taken, we just attach everything together and we've got some armatures. Okay, I've got all those measurements. Uh, we have the armature stands set up. Now we need to make a little jig. So I'm going to use the laser to cut a uh, template or a jig that will help me make this geometric shape nice and perfectly in the clay. Um, so we're going to set that up right now in Adobe Illustrator. The very first thing I built in Illustrator was a scale cross-section of the actual flange and pipe. And then I placed my sculpture, as you can see, upside down onto the flange. And then this red bit is the critical bit. That's the jig itself. And I'm going to build this in several views there. So I'm going to make the base on the bottom. I'm making the top thing. And then, man, this is, it's just, it's confusing to look at. But trust me, this is all going to come together in the end. Uh, and we're going to use the laser, my favorite tool in the studio for cutting armatures and jigs. I exported all of those vector paths uh, to the laser and here you can see it cutting it. I'm showing this being cut in real time because I want to give you an idea just how fast this laser is and also how hypnotic it is to watch. I cannot tell you how magical it is to walk away from your computer and then see something cut in real time in an actual thing that you can touch. And here we are, we've got all our parts. Okay, we've got the parts and let's see if they fit together. I of course did this in my head when I was building on the computer, but I never really know if I put the tabs in the right spot or if I have got the slots flipped flopped correctly until we actually put it together. Right. sanding but that's great that's the most critical dimension okay so we've had a bit of a disaster I ended up breaking this part uh, trying to get the pieces apart I thought I sanded it enough put it together and I fused everything together so you think I have watched Adam Savage on Tested.com saying to measure your materials before you cut anything. And I really should have done that. I should have double checked the thickness of this. This is a sapele, sapele wood. Um, it's funny, Mrs. Van Tiki, when she pulled this out of the bin said she hates cutting this and so she hasn't used any of it. And it's very warped. Um, but I thought it would be fine for this. Uh, now, this is supposed to be three millimeters thick, but with all of the wood stuff, it can vary wildly. This has been in the drawer forever. It's probably expanded. The center of this is kind of a uh, MDF material with a, a hardwood veneer. So I think it's expanded anyways. It's definitely thicker than three inches. So I've had to go back with the X-Acto knife and trim out a bunch of it. But the good news is, is it's going together now. And oh, that's nice. Now, I don't have this second support fin because I broke it, but I don't really need it. I often forget how stiff wood is. I kind of design this thinking of foam core in my head for some reason when the wood is plenty stiff. So we're gonna get this assembled and well, I might have to sand some pins a little more. <laughs> you can hear how tight it is. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do a little more trimming, but you get the idea. This is going to sit like so. I 
It's gonna be great. Even though it's broken, it's gonna be great. It's a jig, you're not gonna see it. What I need to worry about is how well it will make the finished product look. Now that we've got a working jig, it's time to move on to the next phase of this project, and that is, of course, sculpting. It's time to break out the clay. We are going to be using Monster Clay. It is a wax-based sculpting clay, and we're going to specifically use the hard version. It's extremely hard. In fact, this is extra hard because I have this stored in the glaze room, which was quite cold. And since this is a wax-based clay, that means the colder it is, the more firm the clay will be. Uh, so once I force it out of the box, which is extra tricky because it is, like I said, extra firm today. I chop it up into a whole bunch of little pieces. I use a, uh, like a, like a painting scraper tool to cut it up into a whole bunch of little cubes, which then go under a heat lamp to soften up that clay and get it ready for use. All right, it is the next day. I have had the monster clay all chopped up and warming up under the heat lamp all morning, so it's nice and soft and ready for sculpting. I think that we're going to dive in and start to block out this form using our magical template here. Um, one quick note before I start, and that is on the armature uh, size. Now, um, I could maybe pack some like aluminum foil on here in order to save in clay, like the amount of clay I need to use to fill the space between the armature and the piece. But I like to err on the side of giving myself plenty of clay between the armature and the piece because who knows, maybe I want to like carve in a deep mouth detail and I don't want to run into something that is not clay. So be sure to give yourself lots of wiggle room. Um, now, that being said, uh, I would be lying if I have said in the past I haven't had to go back and surgically remove bits of my armature um, because it got in the way. In fact, if you go and watch, I think, any of my sculpting videos, you'll see me doing that. This one, I think I'm safe, and I really hope I'm safe because uh, I'm not going to be able to remove any of this steel. It's not like a wooden armature inside of here. If I run into this, I'm doomed. So I got plenty of room, though. I don't see how I could run into it. Hopefully I didn't just jinx myself. Let's get some clay on here. All right, the clay is in motion. For this initial part of the sculpting process, what I'm really working on is just packing that clay firmly onto the armature. I want to make sure this initial kind of coat of clay has a great bond with that pipe. Now, you can see occasionally I'll go in with a little bit of like, that's some dust off. That's like a canned air spray. And I turn the can upside down and freeze the clay. When you do that, a very cold blast of air comes out of it and it locks the clay onto that armature. Remember, this is a wax-based clay. So as you build it up, if it's warm, because it's been under that heating lamp, it can kind of sag. So as I build up this form, I am just jetting it on occasion with the canned air to chill it in place. To further cool the clay, I'd put it in front of a fan during lunch to just really firm things up. All right, I am back from lunch. Uh, this is nice and cool. It's been in front of the fan for the, you know, about an hour. And the clay that I had under the heat lamp that I just cut is super soft, like like liquid. So that's fantastic. We're going to get back at it. Uh, my goal today is I just want to get the form done. I want to get a nice, smooth, perfect version of this. Uh, and then tomorrow we will get into plotting out the details. And once that is done, then we can get a texturing. But today, today's just all about form. All right, now as we are getting closer to the edge of the template, you're going to see the template magic really take effect. What I do is I build up the clay right up to the edge, and then I actually build the clay a little past that template edge, then rotate the template around the clay and shave away a little bit of the clay. It's like a, like a giant clay lathe, and it gets the form exactly symmetrical, and it matches the template perfectly. It's pretty great. After using the jig, I went back with like a steel kidney tool, which you can see here, to further smooth the surface and just kind of get things nice and uniform. I also used a large guitar string rake to just, you know, even out those tool marks, even out any bumps and lumps, and get ready for the next big step of the sculpting. Okay, I realized I just mentioned a, a guitar string rake casually, as if everyone knows what a guitar string rake is. I think it's a good time right now to pause the sculpting and talk about tools. And I'm talking about my favorite sculpting tools. Music 
yes, I wear Crocs in the studio. Well, they're actually Birkenstock clogs because I am fancy. And here are my sculpting tools. Now, this looks like a complete mess, but there is actually some method to this madness. Here I have all of my uh, just kind of regular edge tools. This will be like pointy tools and flat tools, like spatula tools. Here are all my ball-ended tools. So these are tools that end like in a ball. It can be either a wooden tool or I've got metal versions of that. Here are all of my small loop tools. So these are tools that end in a loop. And as you can see, they are the small ones. Then we move on to our larger loop tools. So these will be larger loops and rakes, including guitar string rakes, which we'll get into in a minute. In the center, I have all of my kidneys, both rubber and metal, including some weird odds and ends and my absolute favorite sculpting rock. And then at the bottom, we have all of my kind of large wood tools. And these are tools that I use mostly for mold making, but I also use them for sculpting large pieces. Then we can move over to my calipers. These are new, I just got these, and they are fantastic. We'll talk about them in a second. And then I have my, uh, kind of my favorite rake tools. These are all my hook rakes and my large loop rake. Whoo! Now, these are all of my tools, but this episode I'm gonna use just a handful of them. So that's what I wanna talk about, my absolute favorite tools that we will be using on this sculpture. First up, let's talk about loop tools. Uh, now, loop tools are any tools that will, as you can see, end in a loop. And they can be both a rake or a wire loop or a guitar string loop. Uh, so here, uh, these are all made by an uh, outfit called uh, Ken's Tools. I'll put a link to them in the um, description of this video. Uh, this one is a great one that I love. It is both a rake tool that uses a, uh, this is actually like a bandsaw uh, rake, a uh, bandsaw blade. And then the other side is a guitar string rake. So a rake, as you guessed, is, uh, it looks like a, what you use in your garden. It's got little teeth on it and it rakes away the high points of your sculpture and it's great for smoothing over forms. And then the guitar strings are actual guitar strings. And if you look at this, I mean, you hear that? That is what is going to sculpt your piece down. And, and you can work from a large guitar string like these. These are very large guitar strings all the way down to much more fine guitar strings. So you can see these, it's a much more fine guitar string. I don't play instruments, but I guess that uh, you can apparently get guitar strings in different size. And I even have smaller ones than this, but we're not gonna use it. But these I love all the time I'm using them. Continuing along rakes, we have these hook rakes. And I'm telling you, I use these tools all the time for sculpting. They are made by Ziem, Ziem tools. I don't know how to pronounce that, but I'm gonna put a link to it. Uh, these come from very large down to a very small, and I use them all. These are made out of stainless steel. They are fantastic, and I can't recommend them enough. I will put a link to those also, and you'll see me using these like mad throughout this episode on the sculpture. Lastly, we have got the spoon or like flat, I don't know. I don't know how to describe these. I just, they're non-loop tools and I use these a lot. These are kind of my heavy hitters. Um, first off are these three by an outfit called Sculpture House. Uh, two of them are identical, but just in different scales. And one side of these is like this kind of spatula thing and it's nice, it's a spring steel, it's very flexible fantastic for packing in clay and smoothing out things. The other side is this interesting shape that is great for cutting away details and smoothing in little bits. And they are identical, just one is small and one is big. Well, they're not quite identical. The bigger one has some serrated edges on one side of this. So it's got a little bit of a rake on one side and then a smooth thing on the other. These are incredible. Sculpture House, let's see, this is Sculpture House tool number Oh boy, it's really hard to read these things. You know, I'm just gonna have to look it up and we'll put it in the description of the video. This looks like 63 and I don't know, 54. I, I'll try to find it out. If I can find it, I'll put it in the description. Lastly from Sculpture House, I have this extra tiny one. I bought this on my first week in Hollywood right after we moved to LA and I wanted to be a sculptor working in a special effects shop. Spoilers, I barely did any sculpting there, but I did get to use this tool and I've had it for, God, many, many years. They still make it. Um, one end is an extremely small kind of spatula shape and then the other end 
is a kind of chisel shape, and this is a fantastic tool for doing small, detailed sculptures. It's also made out of a kind of a spring steel. Fantastic. The last one that I want to talk about today, uh, this was sent to me by uh, Hoga Tools. Uh, they thought I might enjoy some of their tools, and they were right. This thing is unbelievable. Uh, I love using it for making molds. It's basically like, um, kind of like, I have a lot of wooden tools like this, but I love this because it's not wood. That means I can use it with water and alcohol and things like that, and it won't uh, warp or change shape. Um, it's just a fantastic shape for smoothing and working in details. Uh, I will put a link to this one as well. And then I guess we will be talking about one last thing, and that is calipers. I love using calipers when I'm trying to do symmetry. You can measure the size of objects. You can measure them both this way, or you can also measure with this way. You can kind of measure the size in between things. Um, they are incredible tools. Now, calipers, I had a couple uh, just kind of general aluminum calipers that I bought from, you can buy it almost like any ceramic store. And I'm gonna be honest, they were pretty sucky. Uh, these are also by that company, uh, Hoga Tools and they make three different sizes, and these calipers are gorgeous. They are made out of stainless steel. They are super well machined, and they come up to a, just a fantastic point. They seem just very accurate and great. So I love these things. Your eyeballs lie, but calipers don't. So this is just a handful, obviously, of the bazillion tools that I use. Now, I don't use all of these tools all the time, but I generally use just about every tool in this drawer when I can. Now, you don't have to have a fancy super tool to sculpt with. When I was in LA, the lead sculptor at our shop, uh, Evan Campbell, his favorite tool to use was a fork that he think, well, I mean, rumor has it that he took it from his uh, school cafeteria. So you don't need the fanciest tools. And sometimes you can get in the mindset of like, I can't sculpt unless I have that one tool or, hey, that person's using that tool. I gotta have that tool. That's not the case. Use tools that work for you. These tools are my favorite and they work great for me, but you talk to another sculptor and they may not be a big fan of these tools. So experiment. If you can, go to a ceramic store, pick them up, touch them, find out what feels good in your hand, and yeah, go from there. Anyway, that's enough about tools. Let's get back to sculpting after I put all these away. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that I have gotten the form to the point uh, where it's as far as it's gonna go and we are done using the fancy jig. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's not, but it's, it's not done yet. We still have a lot to do on it. Uh, it has definitely reached the point where I want to flip it over so it's right side up. Um, it'll make it a lot easier for me to finish up this top area. And of course, it'll make it a lot easier to put the face on it. So let's Take it off of armature number one, or armature base number one, and put it up on armature number two. There we go, and it's a great height for working on it. <sighs> nice. Okie dokie, it is Friday, and it is time for me to commit to getting a face onto the new porcelain pounder. Uh, I've got the form, I love the form, it's fantastic, and uh, it's time to get serious. Now, I have re consulted the past pounders and the faces that I put onto them, and I have gone and drawn a whole slew of different variations of the faces that I could put onto this pounder. I like to make these a little more. Now, when I do my, uh, my mug sculptures, I like to keep them very fantastical. I source from a lot of Polynesian elements that I love, of course, because these mugs celebrate Polynesia. And uh, for the pounder mugs especially, I like to really kind of dial in on a very Hawaiian style because that's where I grew up and that's where I fell in love with Poi Pounders. Uh, but for this one, I also want to break away from an established look that I have in previous Pounder mugs. Um, so Mrs. Van Tiki was kind of the tiebreaker in this and she picked the one that she liked. So we're gonna go with a combination of this one and the eyes that I absolutely love on the very first Pounder that I did. Um, so let's do it. Now, this is a weird form. It's kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> 
it's definitely not flat and it does a lot of bizarre things to the plane. So it's difficult to lay out a pattern and put it on here. I usually like to do this with tracing paper and I'll put the paper down and transfer my designs like that. It kind of works and it kind of doesn't. So I'm gonna try a combination of my paper templates and maybe a little bit of laser level to get a good straight line in here. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Let's just dive in. So I've got a rough concept and I've got a really weird shape. That means it's time for some tracing paper and uh, pens and pencil. So I know I'm gonna be going through a lot of different iterations. I basically would sketch out an idea on some tracing paper, fold the tracing paper in half so I can get some nice symmetry. Uh, then I would like go back with it. You can see I've got a little pen here and I'm just laying out both sides of the face. I would hold this up to the model and see how it would wrap around the model. And if I like the way it looks, if I liked the way it looked, I would maybe change a small thing and then move on to another model. So here I lay down my first idea, I'm tracing it, I'm gonna make some subtle changes, do another idea and another idea. Anyways, I ended up doing about seven or eight of these sketches, moving the eyes up and down, changing the shapes of forms until I got something that I really liked and I thought would wrap around the clay pounder shape nicely and look great from different angles. Lasers! Yes, the laser level has made its appearance. I use a green laser level uh, to put a kind of an anchor line. I, I know I have a, a horizontal line here. This is a horizontal level line, but I need a vertical level line. And this line will represent the center of the face. Now I'm gonna go ahead with a tool and lightly scribe that line in so I don't have to have the laser on all the time. And of course the laser, you know, when I'm sculpting, I can't see the laser. Um, and this is just a reference point to help me with symmetry when I lay the face out onto the piece. Uh, I will occasionally go back and refine that line. And in the end of the thing, I'm gonna erase the line. The line will not be on the final sculpture. It's just a reference point for me to make things as symmetrical as possible. So normally I would totally be doing this on the computer. I usually lay out a lot of my initial drawings. I'll draw them on my iPad or my sketchbook, and then I'll take those into the computer and do iterations on the computer and then print out templates. But this is such a weird form. The, the, the poi pounders are so tapered and cylindrical that it's difficult to figure out how a design will wrap around that form until you actually have the form. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of doing this on paper. And also it shows you don't need a computer or an iPad or anything like that to play with iterations and try different shapes and forms. Um, so yeah, I'm just uh, going at these and going at these. And it's funny, like, I'm shooting these, I'm like, I'm gonna stop filming them because I just keep doing different designs um, and I'm gonna run out of film. Of course, I'm not gonna run out of film, but man, think about back in the day when they're shooting documentaries and they would run out of film. We live in a wonderful future time, especially if you're an artist. Once I got a template that I liked, I cut the eyes and mouth apart separately. Why did I do this? Well, it helps you to wrap it around such a strange mix of convex and concave curves that the poi pounders have. Uh, I would hold it up against there and then I would just tack it into place using a couple of thumbtacks. It's kind of very old school, but it works really well. I'd repeat the process for the mouth and uh, this again is nice to have these as separate pieces because I could nudge it up and down and get it looking exactly how I wanted to look before committing to the next step. What is the next step? Well, we're going to scribe these lines into the clay using a sharp tool. I think in this case, I'm using an X-Acto knife. After doing the mouth, we would move on to the eyes, nose, and other features, and then voila, we've got them permanently marked. Well, not permanently, but we've got a great durable line in the clay that we can use as a guide for adding all of the features. Clay is a fantastic medium because it's both additive and subtractive, meaning we can add clay onto the piece and we can subtract clay away. And we're gonna do both in making this face. Uh, we start by doing an additive bit where we're gonna add a bunch of clay to build up the nose bridge. From there, we're gonna move on to subtractive sculpting where I'm going to actually be carving away a little bit to make those kind of like larger facial circles that surround where the eyes are going to go. Uh, that's what I love about clay. When you work in stone, it's only subtractive, but when you work in clay, you can do both adding and subtracting. It's math. All righty, it is Monday morning. I have got my tools laid out. I got my close-up glasses on. And I think, I just think we're gonna be able to finish this today. Uh, I've just got to, now that we have, I mean, last week we blocked out all the areas. We got the general form. Today is just about final detailing and texturing. And I think that if we just really focus, we can do it all. So let's get to it. 
Now, it's important to not get too far ahead of yourself in one specific part of this sculpture. We are blocking it out right now, meaning we are just roughly getting all of the features in and we're not worrying about details or specifics. We are worried about balance and symmetry at this point. Once all the main facial features are in, then you can start to tighten things up and you move from larger tools to kind of medium sized tools and from medium tools to smaller tools. And you're just smoothing out those planes, tightening up that symmetry and slowly and slowly adding detail, making sure not to work too hard on one spot at any given time. The eyeballs are a spot where the paper templates are a huge help. I uh, use an X-Acto knife to just kind of do the rough carve of the eyes. And then I go back in with one of my favorite little hook rake tools to uh, block out the initial shape of it. Now I'm going to add a little bit of clay on top because I want these to protrude just a bit. And I know I'm going to be putting a pupil in these later. Okay, uh, quick, uh, quick talk about symmetry. So symmetry is really important and your eyes will lie to you. So every time I'm doing something like this where two sides have to be symmetrical, you always want to avoid going too far on one section before you start the other. So I put uh, I put this eyeball in here and now I have got to kind of pause there. I don't want to go further in that detail until I get this eyeball at the same stage. It is critical that you don't put everything into one half and then try to match it on the other half um, because you, you just well, I mean, for me, it doesn't work. I've always got to just do a little bit and then a little bit, a little bit and a little bit, or else I, uh, I just can't keep up. On that note, we tackle the other eyeball. Now I'm gonna repeat the exact same steps using the same tools in the same order as the first eyeball to get eyeball number two as closely matched as I can to number one. When they're both in the same spot, I go in kind of backfill and uh, just fill in all of those details. I'm thinking about how the molding is going to work, so I'm watching out for any undercuts and any spots that might uh, just make molding difficult. Okay, it is time to add the pupil to the center of these eyes. Now, I originally was going to use this little copper pipe tool. I use this thing all the time. It's one of my favorite sculpting tools. It's got a large circle and a small circle, but that small circle is still just a bit too big, so I'm going to use something extra special. That's right, I'm using a Sharpie. I found that the diameter of the cap of this Sharpie makes a perfect pupil. Okay, everyone's gonna be looking at these eyes, so I am going to really uh, be very careful when I position them and push them in here. And once I get them pressed in, I go back with one of my favorite little tiny detail tools and kind of scoop out uh, like an inverted hemisphere for where the pupil will be. With the eyes in place, we're in the home stretch of sculpting, and that is the detailing nitty-gritty. We are going from bigger rakes to smaller rakes, to even smaller rakes, and then to smoothing tools to slowly erase all of our tool marks and get all of our planes nice and smooth and pretty on the sculpture. Now, of course, we're going to make making this thing look like a rock afterwards, but before we make it look like an ancient rock, we have to make it look like a perfect smooth sculpture. At least that's the way that I like to do it. One of my last steps for finishing is I would like to spray it down with some rubbing alcohol and then use a scotch Brite pad. This is like a, a soft scotch Brite pad, like what you'd use to, I don't know, clean your sink. And uh, the alcohol acts as both a lubricant and as it evaporates, it cools the surface, which keeps the clay cool. And it's slightly a solvent, so kind of will break down the clay, but not that much. It's a very minor, minor, minor solvent. So I'll just lightly brush over the surface with the scotch Brite pad, just to get, like I said, I'm looking for smooth planes. We're not looking, this is not the finished surface, this is just the starting surface for our textures. Okie dokie, we have brushed and sanded and smoothed, and I am very happy with all of the placement of all of the features, and that means it is time for texturing. And we are going for this look. We want this to look like a piece of volcanic basalt. So I'm going to do that in two ways, I'm going to use a tool to go in and sculpt like a bunch of little divots. And then I'm also going to use an advanced technique called hitting it with a rock, which I will show you in a little bit. We kick things off with this small loop tool and I'm just basically going around and placing a bunch of depressions in the surface. These would be gas bubbles in the lava when this rock formed a million billion years ago. And yes, we are gonna be adding lots more texture on top of this. So think of this as like the first strata of bubbles that we're gonna be adding. Um, and it's just a great way for me to kind of lay out a rough texture pattern uh, just to give a nice overall rough feel to the piece. 
Once I've got that base pattern down, it's time for the rock. Yes, I have a special rock from my backyard when we lived in Hawaii, and I depress it into the surface. Now I'm covering the piece first with a spritz of alcohol to keep things from sticking, and then a sheet of plastic, and that keeps clay from building up on the rock as I push it into the clay. And I will just push it in a little bit, peel the plastic back, check my progress, push it in some more, and just keep on going. Apply as often as needed to make a good looking rock surface. Now, whenever I do the plastic bag in rock technique, it's important for me when I do this to go back with a loop tool like this and scrape away the areas of clay that get raised when you push the rock in. Now, remember, this is a worn down volcanic rock, so it shouldn't have any raised areas. When you press something into the clay, inevitably a little bit of the clay lifts up. So I'm going to work all that away so I'm only left with divots and gaps. After the initial pass with the large loop tool, I'll go back with a very fine detailing rake. This is a small, fine guitar string rake. And I'm just doing all the little final touches, looking for any little bits of the clay that are sticking up that I don't like. You want to be really meticulous about this. This is going to be your final surface of the mug, so you want it to be perfect. Okay, folks, put on your safety goggles because we are going to do the most dangerous part of this entire sculpture, and that is melting back the surface. Now, this is a wax-based clay, like I said, so you can get a nice smooth sheen on the surface if you very, very carefully hit it with a torch. Now, I have one of these little baker torches, and I can vary it between a very loose kind of soft flame all the way down to a very pinpoint blowtorch. You want to practice with this on some other bits of clay before you hit your main sculpture if you've never done this before because you can very quickly melt away all of the detail and work that we put into the piece. Believe it or not, the torch will even lift up some clay while it's doing its melting action. So again, we take a very fine tool and we shave away any bits of the clay that lift it up. Because again, I'm looking for worn rock, so that means no little bits sticking up and getting in your way. Hopefully you're realizing that the closer you get to finishing a sculpture, the longer the little finishing steps take. It is just the nature of the beast. Uh, people often ask, how do you get the clay so smooth? Well, the way you get the clay smooth is by putting a ton of time into smoothing it. After going over with the rake and some alcohol and a brush and maybe a little bit of more torching and then a brush, we end up with this, a beautiful, worn, ancient basalt rock surface. I cannot wait to cast this in black porcelain. Oh my gosh, I think that we are done. I cannot wait to get a mold onto this. Now, of course, we don't have time to film me molding it in this episode, but to tide you over, I will put the link to the Puka Pounder, making of the Puka Pounder mug, uh, right around here, and I will see you on the next episode of Tiki Technical Tuesday. Thanks for watching.